Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, as we uh, turn our hearts to you now to hear your word, to sit under your word, we do so knowing that we haven't come in our own merit. Even the faith that we have to receive and understand and apply your word is a faith that's given to us. We rejoice in that this morning, that you have granted us faith. You've opened our eyes to believe. You've, we've op you've opened our eyes to trust. And you've opened our eyes to fellowship even uh, one with another. But, but of course, uh, under your care and hand this morning. Lord, as uh, I minister, strengthen me through this ministry. May uh, the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, as they've been this week, may they be pleasing to you, and may they be fruitful for this body. In Christ's name, amen. amen. So a longer reading, but my preach is actually focused on verses 1 through 5 of 1 Corinthians 2, and in particular, verse 2, where, where Paul says, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him uh, crucified. I'm going to use in my preaching points a word that I want to explain just in case it's, it's a little too biblical or theological, uh, sufficiency. Now, I'm being invited out to lunch today, and if I said afterward, you know, if, if they asked, how did I enjoy it? And I said, well, it was sufficient. <laughs> you get the point, right? <laughs> um, the biblical sense of the word sufficiency is not, oh, it's just enough. It's, it's more than enough. It's an abundance of enoughness, if you would. Uh, Paul said that he had to rest in the grace of God because it was sufficient for him through all trials. And so biblical sufficiency means that God has given us everything we need to accomplish everything he's asked us to do. Uh, and so we're looking today at the sufficiency of Christ. I'm going to take a chance here and uh, draw from a, a great old movie, The Wizard of Oz. Hands up if you are familiar with The Wizard of Oz. Oh, that's pretty good. Uh, it's that story of Dorothy from Kansas and her dog Toto, and they get whisked away in a whirlwind and brought into another land, a land called Oz. When she arrives, she says to her faithful Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. That saying has become a cultural idiom to express the feeling that many of us have as Christians in today's society of living in a place they no longer know feel, or feel comfortable within. When you read a newspaper, when you listen perhaps to popular music, or just in general observe the culture we live within, we can feel like strangers in a strange land, don't we? One question we then face is, what does evangelism now look like for us? How do we bring the gospel message into everyday life and conversation? Well, I want to commend this morning to trusting in the time-honored and more importantly, biblically faithful view of trusting in Christ and in Christ alone. It's quite a faulty assumption, actually, to presume that our times are so complex, that we face issues that are so complex. We do, undoubtedly. I'm a pastor. I face all kinds of issues. But it has never been easy to bring Christ into culture. It's never been easy to share the gospel. And so when we look to Paul in Corinth, that's what Andrew Miller asked me to preach from tonight. Acts 18, Paul arrives in Corinth, and hence this morning we'll look at the motivation that Paul had in, in Corinth. Tonight we'll look at his encouragements in his mission work. So firstly, we preach the sufficiency of Christ. They say the first impressions are lasting impressions. As Paul came to Corinth, he would have had every temptation to make the kind of impression that would impress. At best, he had mixed success in Athens. If you've been following the Sunday evening preach in, Fern, uh, in Newark, 
They were just in Act 17. And, and he had at best, like I say, mixed success, success in Athens. And so how would he put his best foot forward as he goes on to his next city, which is Corinth? From a Corinthian point of view, to get in with the elite, the movers and the shakers of society, it meant having this polished presentation, the polished presentation of professional orators or the, the lofty intellect of the philosophers or the flamboyance of first century sophists. Sophists were just these carnival barkers that would say that they were spouting wisdom, but really it, it was deception and they would do it in such a flamboyant way it would draw a crowd. I think it's hard for us to appreciate the importance of public speaking and rhetoric in Greco-Roman world because our world, our culture today is so relentlessly visual. We've lost, I think, the idea and the skill of listening and thinking. In our day, we think with our feelings and we listen with our ears. I mean, we, we uh, look with our ears. In ancient times, to be a skilled orator was to be a man of influence and great power. And then you add to this Paul's reality of the struggles that he's had. He's come into Europe for the first time on his second missionary journey, and he's found struggles. It hasn't been like it was in Palestine and Asia Minor, where he has been on his first journeys. He's been imprisoned in Philippi, in Thessalonica, his his mates had to smuggle him out of the city under the cloak of darkness. In Berea, he was hounded there as well, not because of the biblical Bereans, but because the, uh, the ones from Thessalonica had followed them there, and they, they hounded him out of town as well. And then, of course, the, the, the struggle in Athens with the philosophers. So then I wonder, what has occupied his mind? He's had a 50-mile walk to Corinth. He's done it on his own. His partners in ministry are elsewhere. He's had a lot of time to think. He knows he's going to face more intellectual scrutiny, but he also knows he's coming into a, a city that was renowned for its moral depravity. But what we find that in spite of his recent experience and challenges, and in spite of what he was heading toward in Corinth, he resists the, the temptation to argue. He resists the temptation to argue vainly with philosophers. He doesn't meet the professional orators on their ground. He recognizes the only way to confront Greek civilization and Greek eloquence and Greek self-conceit and Greek immorality was to preach Christ and to preach Christ crucified. Now, this wasn't because he was ignorant. It's not because he was blissfully ignorant of what was going on. He knew intimately what he was heading into. We know Paul was a studied man. He was very well educated. He, he was aware of other cultures. He was the one who said, I become all things to all people in order that I may win some. In, with the philosophers in Athens, of course, he could quote from Greek, Greek poets. So it's not that he didn't know. It's not that he was blissfully ignorant and all I know is Christ and that's all I'll preach. No, he purposed that my trust and their trust must be in Christ alone to meet their need. So in the face of this, he decided, he says, to know nothing but Christ and Christ crucified. Now he had said as much already we didn't read 117, I believe, Chris, you started at 118, but in 117 he says, I have come simply to preach the gospel. That was his aim, his goal, his motto. So Paul focuses upon the biography of this one man with particular attention given to one act in this man's story, his death. And that's because Christianity at its root and summation is Christ. If you don't have the Christ, you don't have the Christian faith. Now perhaps it goes without saying, but it's important that when Paul says he preaches Christ, he's not speaking merely of saying his name. It's not that that 
He, he reduces every sermon to something so simplistic. It's, it's that he has to challenge the value systems of that day. And he's going to root every value that he assesses, every value that he speaks, through the lens of Christ and Christ alone. As I've said, we already know he knew he's an incredibly well-educated man. So please don't hear me say that we are then, as evangelists, allowed to simplify our message down to where we only understand the culture by speaking Christ to the culture. No, we understand the, the culture so that we minister Christ within a culture. Well, what was this revelation attested to by Paul that lifts a biography of a man to gospel heights? the power of God for salvation, as he wrote to the Romans. Well, you know the gospel means good news. We all know that. What was then the good news of a mere man? What would be the good news of a mere man dying a tragic death? In itself, it might make for a good Netflix series, but it's not going to make a gospel message, is it? It's not a gospel. The good news relates to who this man was, and why he died the death he did, what his death accomplished. So this was the biography, God, uh, Paul tells us, of the God-man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, with power he describes him as. He was the one who, was, uh, who died according uh, to the scriptures for our sins. That is why this is a gospel biography. This is what makes for a saving, glorious, sufficient gospel. The Son of Man, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, the eternal Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. The Son who died so that we would receive the adoption as sons. Now, I also want to emphasize, though, that this was not just his theme. It's a wonderful theme, of course, of Christ and Christ crucified. But it's the method of demonstration that is important to Paul. Chris read earlier that uh, from the previous chapter in chapter 1, we preach Christ crucified. He said the Jews demand signs. Why did they demand signs? Well, they wanted to look for somebody who would do something. Maybe a priest Maybe a, a, a liturgy of some sort. Some man that would do something religious that we could follow and trust. Jews demanded signs. The Greeks sought after wisdom. Why did they do that? They wanted someone who could debate and argue and present themselves with these lofty ideas. Paul says, no, we have nothing to do. We have nothing to come to philosophize about or to argue. We come with a message a fact, a message of history, a message of a life that was lived and a death that was died. And so we preach Christ and Christ crucified. Now, what does that look like for us today? You know, Paul says nothing but, nothing but Christ. And that sounds awfully narrow, doesn't it? To our culture, it must be quite jarring to say that we preach simply nothing but Christ. But though it's narrow in its focus, what we see as we understand the gospel is it's as broad as it can possibly be in its application. It's narrow in focus, but broad in application. See, Paul knew that if he was to give the Corinthians what they needed, then he must refuse to give them what they wanted. That's often true for us in life, isn't it? We know as parents, we have to know what our children need, not listen to simply what they want. Though he denied their wishes, at the same time he satisfied their deepest, deepest necessities. The gospel goes deeper than our superficial human needs, always. It goes deep to the heart of the deepest necess necessity, and that is, of course, reconciliation with God, our Creator. And so we preach Christ, the sufficiency of Christ. 
Why do we preach the sufficiency of Christ? Because we trust, we trust in the sufficiency of Christ. You can look with me again at uh, 1 Corinthians 2. In verses 3 and 4, he says, In weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Now, can you imagine such a strap line in public life? I came in weakness and fear and much trembling. I know you just had some local elections, I believe, on Friday of this past week. Uh, in my province in Ontario, we have elections coming up, I believe, on June 2nd. And I can guarantee you, um, not a single politician is going to say, I come to you in fear and trembling and weakness. Uh, you can tell me if it happens, but I'm not going to hold my breath. This is the complete opposite of the self-confident, polished orator whose uh, presentation and presence would command attention. It's a message that is weak. That's certainly the claim, the claim that comes from the crowd. It was foolishness, right? Foolishness to the Jews and the Greeks. The cross is still foolishness. It's about a, a weak man who suffers at the hand of others. And of course, our message is brought by weak people. Paul was willing to boast in his weakness. Well, why does God use foolish things to confound the wise? Is it because he's a show-off? Does he sort of, in a way juggle with one hand behind his back look what I can do I can use these weak people that's how strong and powerful I am that's missing the point entirely no he demonstrates power through weakness so that we would never ever be tempted to trust ourselves to trust in our strength in our wisdom in our courage in our self-confidence it must be in Christ. I love uh, John the Baptist. He gets such a short narrative, but it's, it's such a powerful ministry that he has and an important one. He was that forerunner to Jesus, the one, that voice crying in the wilderness. And he attracted such attention that people wanted to know, who are you? And he answered simply, I am a voice. That's all I am. I'm a voice. I must decrease. He must increase. And so to preach Christ effectively involves trusting Christ and not trusting ourselves. One old preacher talks about us having to efface ourselves for the sake of Christ. And that's so true. We preach not ourselves because our trust is not in ourselves but in Christ. It tells us that we can't fear weakness and frailty and insufficiency. I often think of how important it is to be vulnerable. Sometimes as a pastor you need to be, I think, but, but just in general, I, I think the church would be well served by wearing its vulnerabilities on its sleeve a lot more than it does. Uh, I've got a dear congregant who loves to share Christ and does so in very ordinary ways. She will invite uh, neighborhood women into her home and purposes almost to not have it perfect. If she doesn't put away every last dish from the sink or wipe every drop off the countertop. She just wants to be a real person, to be vulnerable, to share fears that she has. And we do that because then it puts the focus on a strong and mighty and sovereign God. What room is there when we are so put together what room is there for a savior? What room is there for a crucified savior, a suffering servant? Paul needed encouragement. We're going to find out more about that tonight from Acts 18. But the great apostle, epic in so many ways was his ministry, and yet he needed encouragement. We also, we're just as human. We need encouragement. And I think it gives us opportunity, as Paul would say, 
to, to display that grace that makes us sufficient, that makes us strong in Christ and not in ourselves. God is our strength. So trusting the sufficiency of Christ, by extension, I, as I'm saying, implies that we can't trust ourselves. But moreover, trusting the sufficiency of Christ means we do not look elsewhere to add to our gospel message. This is a massive challenge for church leaders today. There always is going to be the contention that the issues of our day uh, cannot be met by the power and wisdom of a first century savior. Now you may not have had it worded like that, but probably people have challenged you. What makes the Bible relevant to our issues today? I have issues that come across my desk um, that I couldn't have imagined 20 years ago. So I'm not denying the complexities of life. Carl, you can probably say the same. Um, I've had a 13-year-old girl, um, not a member of the congregation, but speak of some of the gender confusion that she's experiencing. These are issues of our day. But I want to point and, and commend to you the ministry of Christ because that's the only anchor, not only for our souls, but it's the only way through which we're going to understand what true humanity is, is to understand Christ, the perfect human. And so voices from inside and outside the church are going to constantly demand that pulpits preach a more ethical gospel, a more moral gospel, a right side of history gospel. But even if I grant that such concerns that are expressed are well-meaning, and they're not always, but they're certainly wrong-headed. The claim, of course, is that we need a bigger tolerance, a, a bigger love, a bigger hope, a bigger gospel, a bigger God. But what we inevitably get is exactly the opposite of what we desire, what we think we're reaching for. We get a small, impotent God made in our sad, broken image. A God so shallow he can't possibly satisfy the vast depths of our needs. As a pastor, I constantly keep the words of Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians in mind that he calls them simply to be reconciled to God. We have to keep that at our forefront, that it's us that are reconciled to God, not God that is reconciled to us. Any way that we kind of shape and mold and make God to be more palatable to our culture, to, to be on the right side of history, as it were, inevitably is an idol. That's all it is. We've made God in our image, our broken, needy image. So as his ambassadors, we're ministers of reconciliation, calling the world to reconcile to God, not fashioning a God that may be reconciled to its fancies. And so we preach and trust in the sufficiency of Christ, and we then glory in the sufficiency of Christ. Look again at verse 3. I'll read verse 5 as well, 3 through 5. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Verse 5 gives uh, us Paul's goal for the Corinthians, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. It's interesting to me, he uses that word demonstration quite purposefully. You know, the great philosophers and sophists and orators of the day would make much of demonstration. They were all about demonstration, all about the pomp and the circumstance, the performance. Even with just their lofty words, they could put on a show, a great demonstration. And they did it all so that their fame would grow, their fortune would grow, their power and influence would flourish. But Paul sees a pitfall in that. I'm sure Paul could have done that. But he knows there's a pitfall. He doesn't want their faith to rest in him. Because he's just a human. Even if it's a faith in God, he doesn't want their faith in God being through him. He wants it resting in something sure and something permanent. He wants their faith resting in the very power of God. <clears throat> 
I want to take a moment to just emphasize what Paul means by the power of God or this demonstration of the spirit and power. There's a lot of debate, unfortunately, that goes on in churches. Many would take this to mean the working of great miracles. Some movements have even said it's the church's obligation to exercise some kind of power evangelism so that the working of miracles and mighty acts uh, would uh, cause the world to stand and, and to, to take notice of us. Now, I do want to say I'm a pastor and elder in my church, of course, and I believe in praying for the sick as James instructs us to, to lay hands on the sick and pray the prayer of faith as an elder. I believe in that. But surely this context, this verse in this context, is not pointing to that kind of power. For one, it works against Paul's whole argument here. He's, he's, he's not about the show. He's not about drawing attention. It's, he's not about adorning the gospel in some way that makes it so attractive people can't resist it, in some unnatural way. He's already said, actually, in chapter 1, what this power is. Chris read it. When Paul speaks of the power of God in this context, he's talking about Christ and Christ crucified. That is our power. He's not like the showy orators of the day. He wants us to trust in that power, the power of Christ. And what greater power could we have? You know, I love watching, you know, the Lord work sovereignly in people's lives, and, and I have seen it. I've seen things that, that I would say are miraculous, but what greater miracle is there that we would be translated out of the kingdom of darkness and placed into the kingdom of his dear son? Not by any power of us, not by any resonant goodness, but simply by the power of God to reach into our muck and a mire and to pull us out and to place us into new life with Christ. That is the power that Paul speaks of powerfully. And that's the power we have to trust in. You know, it's really important these days for churches. You know, you're looking for a new pastor, and it's an exciting time. Uh, Carl obviously has been you know, faithful in his ministry. He's um, moving on, as understand it, into uh, full-time mission work. It's an exciting time for you. You've seen some growth. I want to commend to you not simply looking for a pastor, but who are you as a church? What is going to root and ground you? Uh, I've just gone through, as I mentioned to Chris during the interview, um, a membership process, and it's exciting. We've had probably 14 to 16 new adults uh, coming into our ministry and with a whole bunch of kids along with us, uh, with them as well. But I tell them, you know, you've got, this church has two pastors. Uh, this church, as in my church, I'm speaking to these new members. And we have, we're, we're blessed to have two, two pastors, and we love the word of God. We, we do our best to preach it faithfully. But I don't want them attending because they either like us or because they're putting a trust in us directly. Our church has uh, documented what our statements of faith are. We have documented what our values are as a church. That's so that our faithfulness as a church isn't predicated on whether there's a faithful pastor in the pulpit or not. It's because they know who they are. And so when they make a decision on who is going to pastor and shepherd and lead us and elder us, it's based on something that will mean that 200 years from now there's still a gospel witness in our community. And is that your desire? Not just to have a faithful pastor that can minister to you and shepherd you and, and love you and care for you, but that it's going to be there for your children's children's children, that 200 years from now in Fernwood there's going to be a faithful gospel presence. I hope that's your desire, and let that, that, let that guide you. In summer, we, we preach, we trust, we glory in the sufficiency of Christ. Now, the irony is that when we're faithful to that message, when we're faithful to proclaim it, and when we're faithful to live it for ourselves, within it actually is the seed of satisfaction for all those legitimate desires that we have 
that I seem to have undermined by my very message today. A sign? Yes, there are signs. There's signs of power that dwells within him who gives new life to the dead. Chris, I think it was, that mentioned that we're assigned to non-believers simply when we love each other. It's a sign that we are his disciples. There are ample signs and evidence of Christ's power and work in our lives as we submit to him. How about wisdom? Yes, there's wisdom. There's wisdom in him, in him, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Paul's language then, let the Jew come to the cross and in the weak man hanging there, find a greater revelation of power than he could anywhere else. Let the Greek come to the cross and there he will find wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, as Paul says. The bases of all social, economic, and political reform, all human flourishing, lie in understanding and applying these principles that arise from the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ. And so we preach Christ and Christ crucified, narrow in its focus, yet also widest in its application of principles. Christian principle to the whole of the world. So like Paul, let us determine to know nothing but Christ, but to also see everything in and through Christ. Amen.